Greetings, a hope and trust, a fun world, and welcome to the fourth installment of the series Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And we're looking at the tithing contract. In this particular series, we want to uh, zero in on the book of Malachi. We are at chapter 3, the verse is 10. And it provides as follows. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. As we reflect on this particular passage, I want us to zero in on the tithing contract with particular reference to the certainty of a contract. For a contract to be certain, it has to have uh, terms that are not vague, terms that are clear, terms that are understandable. And when a court has to interpret the terms of a contract, it would look at its ordinary meaning, its ordinary application. It could also look at how it has been applied in the industry before, and the court, should it fail to find an ordinary meaning, fail to find an application in the industry, it may determine the contract not to have come into existence and not to be valid. So God, this moment, wants us to come to a clear understanding of what the terms of this contract entail. So as we go through this study, we're going to be looking at what is a tithe? What is its purpose? Where is it to be delivered? And what is it supposed to achieve? Its objective, and uh, just to preempt a bit, its objective is not to strip us, it is not a tax regime, but its objective is to increase our faith. So every time we look at the tithe, you want to come to an understanding that this is designed for me. This has me in in, in, in its bifocal lens to make sure that I come out a better person. Before we go deeper into the study, why don't you spend a moment together in prayer? Kind of gracious Father in the heavens above, dear Lord, we are about to consider the tithing contract, which has been designed for us. Dear Lord, we appreciate that it will increase our love to Thee, increase our faith in Thee. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, talk to us. Amen. There are certain principles that we want to come to mind. You know, in, in terms of uh, the industry application, the industry application, it's um, clear that the tithe has to come at a particular sequence. The Egyptian economy was an agrarian economy. So what it meant was these were people who'd um, rear sheep, cattle, goats, and do some um, wheat farming, uh, cereal farming, basically. So when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, at chapter 14, verses 22 and 23, the Bible provides as follows. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So let's notice something here. The tithe has a cycle. The cycle is year by year. Why year by year? It does not mean that these people do not have income throughout the year. They would have had income, but it is designed to take into account that these are people who have an agrarian cycle. That's why it's year by year. And um, should you have someone who has such a setup, maybe you are a commercial farmer or a subsistence farmer, at the end of your farming cycle, you ensure that you bring in your tithe, tithe of livestock, tithe of um, vegetable produce. As long as there is an increase, you tithe it, you tithe it. So for the rest of us, maybe we are not farmers. There is need for us to look at our cycle of increase. It could be a monthly cycle. It could be a fortnightly cycle. You could be working at a setup where you're benefiting uh, daily. You need to then say, what is my cycle? And at the end of that cycle, put together what I've garnered and take it to the Lord's storehouse. We're going to come back to that. And also appreciate that with the passage of time, the Israelites had to bring it physically to the Lord's storehouse. We can also do so electronically. 
There is no harm in that. When we do it electronically, what we're basically doing is we can make a money transfer. That is the increase we have realized over a cycle. So when you're doing an electronic transfer, you're going to realize that you would have still achieved the same thing. Now, what is this particular tithe? You know, this is something that can be debatable. But um, some things are best understood when we come from our native tongues. You know, in, in, in my native tongue, the term tithe it seems, it is simply given as owe chumi. Owe chumi simply means a tenth, what pertains to the tenth. So whenever I would look at this bill, $10 bill, maybe not the, the cleanest, not the smartest, but it does buy things in Zimbabwe. Now, this is a tenth, and in Debele, it's known as Owe Chumi. If you were to use Shona, that's the other dialect in Zimbabwe, Chekumi. And what I, I, I find is that this most probably could have been a translated version to say... Um, a tenth. And when we get into the Bible, the Bible is clear on us bringing a tithe. And not only do we bring this tithe, we also appreciate that it is a tenth of our increase. So we're going to look at the part where we want to establish that where do we derive this tenth from? How do we compute it? Because we're looking at certainty of the contract. And when you get to Genesis 28 verse 21, you're going to find there it. Um, Jacob, he is running from Esau and he meets with the Lord. And after the Lord has promised him that even though you're running from your brother, I will be with you. This is his response at verse 21 and 22. The Lord shall be my God. Let's skip on. And of all that you give me, God, I will surely give a tenth. To you. So now our, our term of the contract becomes certain. Tithe is equal to a tenth. So as far as Jacob is concerned, it becomes clear to him that he needs to give this unto the Lord. And this is not only an establishment of uh, a tenth by Jacob. This is also a realization that the concept of the tithe has been applied in the industry. This is um, the ordinary tithing becomes more pronounced during the time of the Levitical priest. Who is Levi? Levi is the son of Jacob. So when Jacob is um, making this utterance in uh, Genesis 28, Levi has not been born. Aaron has not been born. Moses has not been born. So what is going to happen later on is that the tithe is going to be given over to the Levites. So we are already establishing an industrial practice as it were. How the tithing principle applies before the Levitical priests come into office. And if you backtrack, you're going to find um, Abraham also giving a tithe. And this tithe he gives to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is an interesting priest. He is a priest who is not a Levite because the Levites come after Israel. And this is Abraham before we even get Isaac. During the time of Abraham and Lot, he has just recovered Lot. And from that loot, uh, from that booty, he goes on to give a tithe to Melchizedek. So having given that tithe to Melchizedek, Melchizedek is this priest that has no beginning. This priest that is, we do not know how he ends. So when we get to Hebrews 7 verses 1 up to 9, there right we find Christ being identified as a priest who is after the order of Melchizedek. So this already um, gives us an appreciation that he is this priest who is, um, you know, has an obligation to work towards our salvation. But auto automatically, he is also the priest who should see to it that he receives the tithe of those who walk by faith, like Abraham, the father of faith. Um, I, I, hope, I hope this is helpful. Now, let's... Um, Look at the other term that uh, the author brings here. As we're looking at Malachi 3 verse 10, he says, Bring all the tithes to my storehouse, so there may be food in my storehouse. So we have a fixed um, address where we should deliver the goods. 
where we should deliver the property. So when we look at a contract of sale, the contract of sale ordinarily will have an address where you're supposed to deliver the goods. So unless and until the goods are delivered at the known and a stipulated address, the contract is not complete. Imagine a scenario where you buy um, a couch, a sofa set, and um, the company has this clause that says, uh, after the full purchase price has been paid, you're going to get delivery within um, two hours from that time, or even two days, depending on what the contract provides for. So you, you could have a scenario where you go and pay, and the goods have to be delivered. Ordinarily, in any other purchase contract, the delivery takes place over the counter. When you're at the till, that's where the delivery takes place. But for those bulk goods, um, where delivery has to be done physically, you could have a scenario whereby, in spite of having paid, if the goods are not delivered to your address, where they have taken the, the, the burden to deliver the goods, this is a breach of contract. The contract is not complete. In spite of having you, uh, I mean, having paid the full price, it is not a complete contract until the goods are delivered to the buyer. Now, you could have a scenario whereby, um, I've seen this uh, online for some cases. Um, they would say, you can order and purchase price is going to be paid upon delivery. So what happens is this person brings the goods to your doorstep and you're going to swipe or you're going to transact online. Then at that point, the contract becomes complete. But the term that is a determiner here, that the term that is key is the address. So God says, you will deliver this to my storehouse, to my storehouse. So when you get to the storehouse, either you're going to hand this over to God or you're going to hand it over to his store manager. So let us go back and say, let's apply this historically. How has this worked in the industry? In the past, people would take their tithe to the temple. And this tithe would be handed over to the priest. So let's say the temple becomes the storehouse. The priest becomes the store manager. So this store manager is someone who is under the employ of the store owner full time. Where is the temple today? It is in the church. Who is the store manager today? You may find deacons. You may find the pastor. Those are people who have committed time to receive goods on behalf of the store owner. So when we look at this, what am I driving at? There is a certain school of thought that says the tithe is supposed to alleviate so that there may be food for whose benefit? For those who are needy. For whose benefit? For those who need it. So what we have um, realized of late is there are some who opinion that there is no point in actually taking that to the storehouse. Just identify someone who is needy, give them your portion of the tithe, you have given the tithe. And the reason is very simple. We do not trust those who are uh, 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 you know, employed to manage the storehouse. They will abuse this tithe. So what do we do? We give it to those who are needy. We take it upon ourselves to make sure that it is delivered and it is used appropriately. And in so doing, in so doing, we believe we have returned a faithful tithe. But the Lord says, bring it to my storehouse. That is a material, material element of the what? Of the contract. To my storehouse, not at your discretion. You do not get next to my gate and you give it to whoever passes by and then you say, I delivered it. You pay for it, Mr. MK. That doesn't work. You cannot deliver the goods next door and expect me to pay for them. The contract is not complete. So the tithing contract demands that this be brought to the storehouse. Until and unless it is brought to the storehouse, the conditions that are unlocked by delivery will not follow. And what are these conditions that are unlocked by delivery? We, 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 we met this in the lesson last week. The Lord says, test me, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be no room enough to receive it. So the author refers to this as a surplus. I would also want to refer to this as an obligation. Your duty is to bring the tithe. 
God's obligation is to open the windows of heaven and pour out the blessings that are going to result in a surplus in your life. So God has no obligation to open those windows if you have not delivered the property to the stipulated address, his storehouse. Well, there are those who may not be taking good care of these goods. Let's look at uh, the audit that follows later on. But the, the reason why we give, uh, I mean, we return this tithe, it is not for the benefit of those who receive it. It is actually for our benefit. Tithing is important because it helps us establish a relationship of trust with God. To take one-tenth of your income and give it away, though technically it belongs to God, anyway, truly is an act of faith, and only by exercising it will your faith grow. As I was just reflecting on this, it just got me thinking, mathematically, uh, we have earned 100%, let's use percentages, we have earned 100% with a colleague, a and B, we, we both have earned 100%. Um, my colleague is going to retain his 100% and try to earn a living out of it. The tithing concept says, give away 10% and you're going to do better than the one who has um, retained 100%. I'm waiting for that to sink in. Tithing says, of the 100% you have, give away 10% and the 90% that you remain with, you're going to survive on it and you're going to do better than the one who has not given the 10%. It, it defies logic. It defies logic. That is faith. This establishes a relationship and you're saying, Lord, make up the difference. Lord, I trust you to grow this 90%. It's not a competition as such, but it is a trust statement. It's a statement of trust. And when you do so every month, it revives and emboldens your relationship in the Lord. That's the reason why we do this. <laughs> That's the reason why we do this. It is not that God benefits from it. It's you saying, with less, I can achieve more with the Lord on my side. That's what tithing basically is all about. That's its purpose. That's its purpose. And when you now come to the computation of the tithe, this is another thing that we need to be certain on. Now, the Bible says you shall bring from your increase, from your increase. So how do we establish an increase? How do we establish a profit? The issue is, what do we start with? Someone would say, um, that which is residual is my increase. After I have taken out all the expenses. And for those who have a cycle that is based on a salary as an income, the question would be, what happens to pay, pay as you earn? That is um, a tax that uh, we pay, whether we like it or not. You may have a social security deduction. You may have an AIDS levy deduction. You may have, um, let's say you have funeral cover or funeral insurance deduction. You may have a pensions deduction, a separate pensions deduction. Does it mean you have to factor out all these deductions and then from the net income, then you calculate your 10%? Or you go to the book of 1 Kings and chapter 17, verses 9 to 16. There you're going to find the story of Elijah with the widow of Zarephath. The widow of Zarephath is basically about to eat her last meal and die with her son. She then determines that she's going to go and make a few barns, which they will eat, and then die of starvation. The man of the Lord comes over. Providentially, he does not mention that the brook where the Lord has been feeding him has just dried, but inspires confidence in this lady and says, you go ahead and make that um, meal, but uh, you serve me first. And thereafter, your provisions will not run out until the rain uh, comes. And this lady, by faith, goes on to serve the man of God. The principle is very clear. When we take time to serve God first, our provisions will not run out until the rainy season. God will see to it that we are provided for. Why? Because we have served him first. 
So I speak to those who are on a salary base. God is not running a tax regime. It is not a tax deduction system. God is running a boot camp for my faith. A boot camp for my faith. So that I can grow. So that I can come closer to him. Our relationship can improve. That's the purpose of the tithe, basically. But as God runs this faith boot camp, we want to appreciate that putting him first only helps me. It's not a selfish stance. It helps me because he says, if I were hungry, I would not have told you. So don't think that because of tithe, I'm eating. <laughs> don't think because of tithe, I am, um, you know, creaming money out of you. I own the cattle upon a thousand hills. We are not equals in this thing. We are not equals. It is for your own good. So as the prophet speaks to this lady, I wish for us to, to draw certain lessons on what we ought to do and how we ought to carry our, our, our business. For those who are in a private enterprise, the expenses we will be looking at is let's look at how much you have put in towards your cash outlay, towards the returns that you have realized, which is what you call the principal, your capital investment. Deduct your capital investment. When you've deducted your capital investment, the difference is your increase. What we're talking about, if you have expenses that have to do with realizing this profit, those are deductible. But for you to say even the government tax is an expense that is um, uh, incurred towards me earning a salary, I think that is to stretch it a bit too far. Let's not go to the point of uh, tithing the mint. Because God does not actually tithe the mint. We looked at Deuteronomy 28 last week. Deuteronomy 28, the Lord blesses us from a class kind of blessing. All these blessings shall follow you and overtake you, all of them. So we need to take a generalist approach, not to get it to pinpoint accurate. <laughs> Our faith is not measured on pinpoint accuracy, but it is measured on how we apply the principle generally, generally. So when you go to your tithe, God is not going to say, um, actually from this tithing, you didn't have change for five cents. So I'm docking down the five cents. You know, you put in five cents extra. So you should not have put that. You, 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 are, you are not a conscientious stewardship. I'm a steward. That, that's not how it operates. It operates on a general principle. What is the increase? You don't have to go and start counting the nuts. That's why when you say, I'm going to pull out one bag out of 10, it does not mean all the bags have the same number of nuts inside. Okay, I hope this makes sense. Let's use the class method. Let's use the class method, not the unit count, not the unit count. And the other thing that I also want us to take note of, when we get to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says we must be found to be Faithful stewards. What does this tell me? There shall be an audit of the tithe. There shall be an audit of those who give the tithe. And there shall also be an audit of those who receive it on behalf of God. So God is simply saying, you are accountable for that which you give. And so are you accountable for that which you receive. As you go on to the book of Matthew chapter 25, Begin at verse 19 up to verse 21. There you find the story of the talents. Three um, employees have been given talents. One has been given five, the other has been given two, and the other has been given one. And the objective basically is grow it by 100%. The one who had five grew it to 10. The one who had two grew it to four. And the one who had one buried it. Having buried it, verse 19 is clear to say, then the Lord came and there was a day of reckoning. Why was there a day of reckoning? To establish what they had done with the tithe. So, I mean, with the talents. God takes time to follow up on financial faithfulness on all aspects. Those who are supposed to return it. God would do an accounting to establish that you have returned a faithful tithe. So when ultimately we were told, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the glory of the Father. That's inclusive of tithe. It is inclusive of tithe. I'll go out and on a limb on that one. It is inclusive of tithe. It is not just um, faithfulness to the Ten Commandments. No, 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 no. 
that audit is inclusive of tithe and offerings. That's why when you get to the book of Acts and there is re I mean, reference to the man Cornelius, we, we, we are told your alms have ascended to heaven. So his offerings are an issue of concern and heaven looks at that and says you have done well. But as far as tithe is concerned, in as much as offerings are discretional, tithe is not discretional. Tithe is a requirement. Tithe is demanded of us. I, I think two lessons ago, I, 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 I did mention that this is an express reservation in a contract. God makes it clear, this is mine, I've not given it to you. When you take off with it, that is larceny, that is theft. Actually, he, he, he puts it uh, differently, he says, this is robbery. Robbery, you have taken it by force from me. Not that I am um, <laughs> unable to protect myself or recover, but I want you to know that as far as I'm concerned, you are a criminal. That's, that's, that's what God is saying. Not only are you a criminal, you are one that is not fit to be part of society. When you carry out a robbery, there are so many, so many crimes that, 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 that will just attach to that crime. Let, let us just reflect on this, you know, out of interest. Number one, if you are going to carry out a robbery, and obviously, obviously, no fool goes out to rob with a, a, a gun that is registered to his name. So most likely you are carrying an unregistered firearm. And I hope you don't fire it and hurt someone. But should you fire it and you hurt someone, you're going to at least, at least be uh, um, charged with grievous bodily harm. But if you kill someone, th th that is straight murder. If you even hit someone with anything, that is assault. And should you even force yourself into anyone's home that is breaking and entering? And any property that you're going to pick, that is theft in that robbery. And if you just take off with it, that is larceny. So when God says, you rob me of my tithe, he is not talking about someone who is in the process of it. He is talking about someone who has even carried it out. The property is not with me, it is with you. And you cannot rob me when it is with you. You have taken it from me. That's what God is saying. And the audit has to be done. For those who are in the office, white collar crime. I'm talking to the men of the clergy. I'm talking to the deacons. I'm talking to those who are in treasury. You are responsible for all those tithes. And God will call upon you to account. To account. Because some of those funds are coming in from people who cannot afford it. And as a result, the operations of the church are stifled because someone is siphoning money. The operations of the church are stifled because people have lost confidence in the system because of those who are running these systems. It is not fair. It is a sin, not just unfair. It is a sin. And God says, be found to be faithful. Because if you are like that person who had an arrears with the Lord, he also had others who had arrears with him. He goes to the Lord and he says, please do forgive me. He was not going to pay that debt anytime soon in his entire lifetime. He goes on to find someone else who owed him less and he threw the man in prison. And this comes to the Lord's um, attention. And what does he do in response? He takes the man and throws him in prison. Appreciate that God has a means of dealing with those who are unfaithful. When the audit is done, God has a way of redress. It does not mean we are going to continue to take all these things without impunity. We cannot continue to sin and be indifferent about it. I do not mean to threaten you at this point, but just to bring this to our attention, God's interest is to increase our faith. Bring it all to his storehouse. That is God's appeal. And no appeal is made to gratitude or to generosity. This is a matter of simple honesty. The tithe is the Lord's and he bids us return to him that which is his own. This is the simple reality of the tithing contract. God is simply saying, give me what is mine. Give me what is mine. And it is a minimum threshold. 10% is all that he asks for. Not 15, not 20. This is how the law operates. The law operates on a rule of minimums. If you bring in the minimum, you have met the threshold. But there is nothing that stops you from hitting the limit. 
There are some who give a, a, a second tithe. There are some who give up to 90% of, of their funds as tithe and retain only the 10%. But the Lord gives a minimum. He says, when it is less than 10%, you have robbed me. But what if it's 15? Doesn't matter. What if it's 50? It doesn't matter. When the law speaks of um, setting up uh, regulations, it regulates the minimum prices, the minimum salaries, the minimum that is payable. When you pay over and above, it is gratuitous. But the law does not say you are dishonest when you have paid more. You only become dishonest when you pay less than what is prescribed. And 10% is that which is pres prescribed. I hope from this study you have had time to benefit to some extent in appreciating the tithing contract, which is designed to increase your faith and your love for the master. May the Lord bless you until we meet again. Amen.